Happy Friday, everyone. Uh, it's Ben and Carter, and we're here at the Gateway, and we are doing Gateway office hours like we do every Friday. That was a weird intro. The Gateway? The Gateway. Uh, this is episode 42, <laughs> and we're gateway. talking about how to be an effective founder. In other words, uh, deliberately dropping the ball. Um, yeah, being a founder is tough, and we have limited time. So uh, we're going to go through how we can help you be an effective founder, uh, you know, take better control of your day and, and do essentially uh, what is effective and essential. Wow, that was, uh, that was quite an intro. Yeah. I mean, We're on YouTube. We have podcasts. Please go subscribe to the YouTube channel. Yeah, the get us on uh, <laughs> iTunes and wherever else you can get podcasts. We're on Facebook every Friday at 10 a.m., which you already know yeah. if you're watching right now. But if you're the one that's here right now, and there might be one, uh, you're the one that's important. So thanks for joining us. That's right. Us. It's all about you. <laughs> No, we've had like, we're like, you know, we Steadily don't have climbing. one, we don't, yeah, we don't have one viewer anymore. It's, yeah. it's getting nice. You're not alone. And we have a few viewers in the audience, so that's yeah. always nice. Our hey studio guys. audience is <laughs> growing. It's multiplying like yeah. uh, a virus. We'll have to give them big, something bigger than a <laughs> shoebox pretty soon. Spreading like weed. All right. Princessa with the puns on an early Friday. All right, everyone. Um, so, yeah. Carter. Why don't you do some news first, Ben? I, do I... Am I, am I, I don't trust you to, no, I don't trust you to actually follow any format. <laughs> okay, That's cool. The <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you do the news? Um, okay, I'll start it off. Uh, okay. Congress uh, taking some action, uh, reinstating the Rohrbacher Blumenauer uh, mm -hmm. Amendment. Um, so basically uh, providing a bit more protection for, for or continuing the protection for, for medical cannabis in states. Yeah, it defangs sessions. Essentially, theoretically, of. there's a bunch of hoopla that keeps coming out in the press about sure. session. Don't care. Trump don't care. Um, right. But, but this was the way. What that else is new? Right. Under previous attorney generals, this was the way that Congress was able to prevent them from going after yeah. states that were, uh, you know, had medical laws. It's, ha it's hard to fly a DEA team out with uh, with zero budget. Right. Cool. Right. Um, <laughs> So, so that's good. That's good news. That good. Um, also, um, Vermont eliminated civic and criminal uh, penalties for possession, I think. Okay. Uh, Decriminalization. Yeah. Uh -huh. not, not a bad thing. Nope. Um, so, so I'm sure Ben and Jerry are very happy about that. And uh, Ooh, Can't wait to taste that flavor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they already had half-baked, which is one of my uh, favorite flavors of all time. Yeah. Um, unrelated to cannabis, but... I think most of Ben and Jerry's is related to cannabis in some... Yeah, there's, there's, they're I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're fans. <laughs> yeah, I mean Cherry Garcia, half baked. They're, you know, they. Yeah. They're at least. Uh, Their heart's in the right place. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then what in South? There's South American news. Chile. South American, in yeah. Chile. Uh, I don't know what something just happened over there by Luke, and it was pretty cool. <laughs> it was like yeah, a. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, I guess Santiago will start doing um, cannabis-based uh, medical mm -hmm. sales and, and pharmacies this week, which is cool. Um, so that's nice. And also uh, a little closer to home. Mexico? Mexico. 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 What, 371 to uh, 7? Uh, they yeah, voted to make THC therapeutic. So awesome. Great. Yeah. Great. You know, it, it's a, Mexico's this interesting place. We... Uh, you know, some of us travel there here and there, but like a lot of what we get out of uh, out of there is from the news and, and we hear about the drug cartels and all this. And and actually in the U.S. there was a big concern about legalization, like spawning some action from the cartels. And I can only imagine that that political pressure would be even thicker down in Mexico. Yeah, I don't know what Mexican politics are like too much, but... Yeah. Uh, well, I watch Narcos. So I would I imagine like I there, a decent there would be it. some issues. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure... <laughs> Pablo okay. Escobar days. I was going to say, I, I'm going to reveal something right now. Like, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Is that a show on Netflix or something? Is that oh, a thing? Oh, man. It, it is a great show on Netflix. All right. Uh, Netflix is actually something we'll mention today later, I think. Netflix. Yeah, well, I have a note to mention Netflix specifically. Okay. Um, there we go. But uh, you're the okay, man. cool. You are the man with the plan. <laughs> I'm the man with the plan. So look, we wanted to do. Let's let's get to the the meat of this the show, right? Okay. Um, we wanted to kind of talk about um, purposeful kind of like day to day things that you can be doing, and oh, yeah. we, we struggled over the dropping the ball title, whatever. It's a good title, I guess. Um, yeah. But uh, there's kind of three things that I wanted to bring up and kind of just talk with you and, and the studio audience. Um, and the one is this idea of you know as a founder. So so. Maybe we should set some context. 
we've said this like a million times, founding a company is very hard. There's lots of yeah. things to do. You're resource constrained. It's overwhelming. Um, so it's kind of essential that you figure out uh, how to really do the things that matter mm -hmm. and not do the things that don't matter, which is thus the dropping the ball analogy. Yeah. Right? Can, we, can we abstract this just a, just a step? Because Go ahead. I was, I, was, I, was, I was mentoring um, at Founder Institute this week, and there's a bunch of young founders, uh, tech founders there. One cannabis founder, which was exciting. Um, but I had to have the conversation with them. And I'm like, I don't think you know what running this company is going to be for you. You know, right. a lot of founders come in and be like, oh, I love meal preparation, so I'm going to create a meal delivery company and supply everyone with the, the food that I love making. I'm like, that's great. You've probably cooked your last meal you'll ever make. Right. <laughs> you know, that's you, a logistics company. Yeah, you're a logistics <laughs> company. You're an operations person. You're gonna like be pulling your hair out trying to shave out like every um, iota of time and money like out of the supply chain. And um, I think I scared a few people away from what they were doing. Um, but what that gets down to, and what we're gonna be covering today, is that most of your day is taking meetings. Uh, trying to be as effective as your time as possible to do what's essential. Mm -hmm. And then, like the title suggests, trying to cut out everything else that's not essential for moving your business forward and carrying that ball forward. Absolutely. So let's, uh, let's start with the first one, which is kind of this um, adopting a work, site, uh, a work style that I would, I would call more of a deliberate versus interrupt driven. So mm -hmm. most of you, if you've got like a day job at a, at a major corporation or something, you actually are, are mostly interrupt driven. And it might not be, you know, middle of the day interrupt driven, but you're driven by someone else setting your agenda and giving you tasks to do. Here, here, get these TPS reports in by Saturday. Right, please. do this yeah. and you go do it, right? Um, when you're a founder, uh, that's not true, right? You, there's like, everything to do, right. right? And so one of the first things that you need to do, which I don't think we should talk too much about in this show because it could be a whole show in and of itself, is you know, setting the metrics that are required to kind of move your business forward. So right. you should know what those are at a, at a high level and, and kind of a detailed, I like to have at least, I like to have just one metric that you're focusing on at a time mm -hmm. um, because it's difficult, you know, more than one metric, uh, there is almost by definition, Yeah. Uh, potential for a conflict in those metrics. Yeah. So you have to know what the metric is that matters most. Well, and, and this is why we have so often encouraged founders to just focus on one part of their business. Right. Or, like, or not, right. not one part of their business, have their entire business focus on one key thing. Right, we say like one revenue stream, yeah. one, you know, you can expand, you can be uh, a holding company in, in 10 years when you're worth a billion dollars, but right now, when you have resources that are constrained, you need to be focusing them. And again, we could do a whole episode on that. Yeah. Um, but, but one of the things that means um, are, is you have to kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, and this is something that, by the way, I'm not an expert at, we all struggle with, mm -hmm. right? Um, you, have to, you have to make sure that when you, from when you wake up to when you go to bed, the things you're spending your precious time and energy on are the things that are moving the business forward. And that sounds very cliche and mm -hmm. easy to do, but it's actually quite difficult. And I think it's difficult for two reasons. One is most of us are kind of um, interrupt driven. Yep. Um, and even if we're not interrupt driven, we're task driven. So we like to make lists of tasks and like check them off. I've seen people who are very, very organized and they, they have their task <laughs> list. I'm, yes, I'm looking at you, Michael. Uh, <laughs> it's a great quality. <laughs> but um, he has fantastic lists. I know he gasped out loud when I said that. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, you have those you have those tasks lists, or, or also you're like getting interrupted. People are, you know, I'm well known in the office for like closing the door and writing signs like "Don't bother me, leave me alone." Right? People yeah. are always bugging that you is, when you're right. That is an understatement. You will lock one door, then put yourself behind another locked door that is clear, and then create a whiteboard that says "Do not enter." And actually, it says "I'm not here" or "I'm not here," <laughs> and I'm like. How do you even get in through the first layer of defense <laughs> to even read said sign? Well, I would like to point out that uh, that system evolved. So interrupts are so persistent <laughs> <laughs> in one's day that that's necessary. <laughs> so uh <-huh>. um, <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, the point is we're all, we all tend to be very interrupt driven. <clears throat> Email is a great example, right? 
people uh, fetishize this zero inbox thing, mm. right? And they like wanna, oh, someone didn't send me an email, I gotta respond, blah, blah, blah. And so one of the things that I uh, don't do as often as I should, but when I do it, I'm, I'm more productive, is I, you know, when I get up in the morning, I spend some time, even just uh, like just a couple minutes, yeah. reminding myself of like what the goal is, the bigger goal, like, oh yeah, that's the metric, that's the thing that I've gotta be working on. Yep. And then I literally take out a post-it note probably yeah. have one on me this morning. Yeah, I do, I've got a post-it note, right? <laughs> I take out a post-it note and I write down, I write down like three to five, depending on how busy I expect my day to be, like three to five things that I need to get done that move that forward. Yeah. And some days actually it's one thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, in fact, if I were better, it would probably be one, one or two, one, yeah. one or two things, but. Because I, I know not all five. three things are getting done. No, they done. don't get done, right? Yeah. One thing gets done, so. No um, uh, but I, you know, I write those down. Yeah. And then I literally, and by the way, I didn't make this from Jim Collins. Uh, I, you know, I, I write this down. Great author, good to great, go get it. And um, you know, I write those things down, and then I basically I look at it all the time. Sometimes I post it on my monitor in front of me, so like I'm always looking at those things. And when there's that kind of moment of having just done something, like just completed one little thing, or someone yeah. just talked to you, and there's there's that moment where it's like, okay, well, what I like, what do I do next? The easy thing for a lot of us is to go to email and mm. check email, right? And instead of that. It's like I look at the post-it note and I'm like, oh yeah, those are the things. <laughs> Before I go to bed, I need to get those things done, yeah. right? And it, it gives me some direction. Um, so that's that's one other thing. And so that, that's a daily ha habit that I recommend or some version of that. I've seen other versions of it, but that's that's mine. Yeah, I, I mean, th that that's pretty, pretty granular. That helps you get through the day. It helps you kind of move that ball forward. Um, but like when it comes to like week management, sometimes I realize that because yeah, it's nice to have one key metric. In the end, it's probably unrealistic. Mm -hmm. um, so really segmenting your time and understanding that, okay, Monday is gonna be my office management day. I'm not gonna schedule external meetings. I'm gonna like meet with the team. I'm gonna get shit done for, for the company and its operations. Maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday are external meetings, meeting with founders, doing something like that. Right. And then Fridays, I don't know, maybe doing like a live podcast or something like that. Something useless. Yeah. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think uh, I, I I kind of agree. Uh, the the caveat I'll say to that is often as a founder, um, there are a lot of things that you need other people's help with or support. Mm -hmm. Investors being an obvious one, and so you take your meetings when they're available. <laughs> It's like, okay. That's true. I, I, mean, I do my meeting. There's exceptions. Which means you have to be kind of be aware of the other things that aren't those that you need to But you know what is nice is knowing that you have that pressure release valve. Like, oh, I know I don't schedule meetings on Mondays. And if there is an important meeting that pops yes. up, it's like there's always a spot where it can go. Yeah, so like we use, uh, I don't know if I should advertise them because they're not great, but we use Clara. Right, mm, yeah, to do our might, scheduling and stuff, oh, right? Persist. Right, as, as of right now, we do. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I'll write like a big, do not, I'll just write DNS. I think she actually knows that DNS means do you not schedule. You just tell right? her not to schedule. Yeah, but sometimes I'll like choose a day because I don't. it's not the same every time. I'll, I'll just write it in my calendar. I'll write DNS, I'll make a block. Um, but then I'll, I'll personally override it. I'm like, oh, this investor wants to have a meeting, and, mm -hmm. right? But she won't override it. I so, um, you know, that kind of stuff is nice. But the other thing I want to talk about, versus, like deliberate versus interrupt driven. So one is kind of knowing the things you need to get done. Yeah. And the other one I touched on um, when I talked about email, but part of knowing what to get done is recognizing all the other things that are not going to get done mm -hmm. and letting go of that stress. I mean, like, yep. Yeah. I'm going to be unresponsive to these kind of people or whatever, or I'm gonna, or this is, like, these things aren't going to happen, Yeah. right? And that's okay with me. Yeah. Right? Well, and, and, and I, you know, it, it took some time to realize this, but like, you know, venture capitalists, CEOs, you know, people like this, they aren't hard to get a hold of because they're assholes. They're- Some of them are. Well, some of them are, okay. that is true. I wanna be clear. Um, but what I am realizing that a lot of them are unresponsive and don't have the time of day because they literally do not have the, the time in their day right. to, even, to even pay attention to the email or respond to the text. I mean, I feel terrible. Sometimes my, my friends slip into that category just because things are moving so mm -hmm. fast and all of a sudden it's like three days have passed and I'm like, oh, I think I saw a voicemail come through. Let me listen to that. Right. You know. 
but that happens all the time. And I, I think that, so the, the sad truth of being a founder is that is going to happen. Yes. So you need to make sure that it happens to the right things, right? right? It yeah. can't happen to the things that are critical to moving your business forward. Yeah. And the only way to prevent that is to like consciously drop the things that, that aren't priorities. Yeah, right? and, and, and I think I, I talked about this a little bit when I came back from Berlin. Um, and I do want to just step back for a second and say that, you know, we're talking a lot about work and in the office and, and being a founder and like we will continue to do so for the rest of the show. But this bleeds over into your day to day life as well. Like, you know, set aside the time to be healthy, you know, find out a time you can make it to the to the gym or get some cardio in and, and eat healthy. And You're eat. actually touching on item three, which oh, we will talk OK, about. OK, we'll uh, get there. But but yes, yes, okay. absolutely. <laughs> it, it does occur. So look, in terms of your day to day stuff, like I, I think, you know, those are the things that you kind of need to be aware of. I would say you know, one caveat or sorry, one um, additional thing kind of related to what you're saying is is to police your time very mm -hmm. well. Um, and there was um, I won't I won't say who this was, but <clears throat> in, in one of my startups, um, there was one of the I don't know, top quote in quotes angel investors yeah. in the valley who was uh, involved. And um, the thing that struck me most about him was every time we had a meeting, like let's say it was a lunch meeting, mm -hmm. right? And at first, by the way, I thought he was rude for this, <laughs> um, but I like, later understood the value of it. Yeah. Um, let's say we had a lunch meeting at noon. Right. First of all, when I got there, he would be there at noon. Like he would get there at noon. Wow. Yeah. Like within one or two minutes, like he was there. That's great. Right. Second of all, at one o'clock, like he, you know, at twelve fifty, he was like, "I need the check." And at one o'clock, he's like, "Sorry, I gotta go." He, like in the middle of the conversation, be like, "Okay, great, we can follow up later. I gotta go." Yeah. And like he had scheduled his life in these one-hour chunks, and he was very, very strict yeah. about his time. Right. Um, and he, it turns out he he wasn't doing it to be an asshole. He was doing it because he had a very busy life. He had lots of things to do. And as much as maybe he enjoyed sitting and eating salad with me in San Francisco, right? He had to go do something else. And, and he, you know, he knew that he needed to kind of keep yeah. that schedule and set the precedent for me that like, okay, when we have a meeting that's an hour, yeah. I need to get my shit done in an hour. I can't, spend 45 minutes bullshitting about his kids and then yeah. start the discussion at 12.45, yeah. right? Well, and to be honest, and I'll say, uh, we mm -hmm. uh, need to get better at that. Um, We're not great at that. Not great at it. I mean, it's nice to have conversations with people, but I do find that if we don't have another meeting like backed up on, on one that's existing, it does have a tendency to bleed. Well, now the flip side is like, I don't, this again can, is not totally related to this, but like, Cal Canis, for example, with founders intentionally kind of like lets meetings bleed over if he likes the founder and has like an extra half hour scheduled. Uh -huh. um, so Buffer. Buffer is... Buffer for, for only, but he only does that for specific meetings because he mm -hmm. wants like founders to, if he likes them and he wants to have the flexibility to kind of keep talking for a little while. But, Interesting. Um, okay. but uh, he's probably pretty good about ending it if he doesn't think yeah. the meeting's going well. Um, okay, so that's that. And actually, this kind of bleeds into meetings, which is what we talked about a lot. Um, there's oh, a lot yeah. to say about meetings. <laughs> Do you want to start talking about how to how to deal how to deal with meetings? Because you're going to spend a lot of time meeting people, whether it's investors or potential uh, customers or potential vendors or potential uh, employees or mm -hmm. partners or whatever. Meetings sure. are a big part of your life. So yeah, meetings are a big part of your life. This has been a topic of conversation, and, and as an early a found as an early founder. Um, meetings for you can be very important and any meeting could be very important for you and you don't necessarily important or not yep. um and i think this whole topic actually and we've been accused of this before kind of you know can be addressed to being a founder of any startup or any business like in any vertical mm -hmm. um, but to bring it to cannabis a little bit um, it is still the case where people have a preconceived notion of how you're going to be or act as a founder. Mm. Um, so to earn some brownie points to always like come correct and like be professional and, and prepared, um, it can blow people's minds. They're like, oh, I thought you were going to be some stoner and, and right. like you're actually really professional and got your shit together. Or if you don't do it, it can reinforce their exactly. stereotype of the industry. So it's a very sensitive mm -hmm. trigger, right? Yep. Um, but what I would say is, you know, understanding, taking that time in the morning to look at your calendar, see what you co got coming down the pipe and, 
and like thinking very deliberately, like how can I really impress this person that I'm going to be meeting with? Because they can either invest, they could eventually work with me, they can make referrals, they can be a customer. Like, at the very least, they can talk about you to other people. Exactly right. Um, and there have been times where like a founder comes to a meeting and is seemingly unprepared or doesn't have the most up-to-date like information. And I'm right. like, you are the right. founder of your company. Like no one's gonna have this information besides right. you or no one should have more up-to-date information besides you. And your job is to be the evangelist for your, for what you are doing. Right, so, so part of this, so I mean part of this is about showing respect kind of to sure. the person you're meeting with. Um, and well, shit, respect yourself. I mean, like, and the hard sure. work that you put into building your company. Sure. Um, Sorry, I'm gonna get all no, fired I, no, up absolutely. about this. <laughs> I, I, I know. Um, but let's talk about some of the ways you can prepare. So first of all, there's like sure. know your audience, and and yeah. not generally, but like specifically. Yeah. Who am I meeting with? Oh, I'm meeting with Princessa today. Like, who is she? Yeah. What's her background? What's she doing? What's she interested in? And and this is, I uh, you know, super important. I think. What does she want? Yeah. Why is she meeting with me? Uh, let's assume that she's busy and not just, you know, sitting around doing nothing. Like, why is she spending an hour of her time yeah. meeting with me? What does she want out of this? Yeah. And that's super important to kind of go in thinking so that you can kind of prepare for what she wants. Right. Well, and, and, and beyond that, like, be selfish about it. Like, what do you want? Right. right? So that's the next step. So, so, <laughs> yes. But, like, I mean, I, I would say, like, 50% of the meetings I, I'm in, it is ended with the person saying, how can I help you? I'm right. like, that's an open door. If right. you don't have an answer, I've, I've, I've often asked people that and the answer is like, oh, I'm not sure, just wanted to give you an update. I'm like, thanks for wasting my time. <laughs> I'm like, right, I'm like, right, totally annoying. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I mean, knowing your audience, but then knowing what you want and, and you can actually go quite far with knowing what you want. Yeah. So um, at my, uh, at the, uh, my first uh, startup, we would, before a meeting, uh, I mean, we did a lot of weird things. I think it, this was the story I've told about like everyone reading each other's email that was gonna yep. go externally, yeah, right? Yeah. But um, but it was awesome and great. The other thing that we did was um, before we would go into a meeting, we would sit down and be like, what, like very specifically, what do we want them to, like what do we want out yeah. of this meeting? And it, and it wouldn't be something vague like, well, we want investment. And that was a bad example because we didn't take investment, but whatever. <laughs> we, you know, we want them to buy the thing. Right. Because buying the thing is never going to happen in the first meeting or whatever. Like, you know. So it's like, okay, well, what we want them to do is to say yes to blank, any blank, yeah. like this, this, or this, or to come back with these answers to these questions. Like, these are the things we want out of this meeting. Yep. And we knew very specifically what it was. Yeah. So we never had this vague, like, what are we doing in the meeting? And then everyone, like, some, you know, there were three of us going into a meeting we would all be very conscious of what the goal was. Like, we yeah. want these guys to give us A, B, and C pieces of information and agree to D. We okay, should, We should actually do an episode on this because I, I, I was coaching, when we were doing Pitch Coach, um, I was coaching companies on on having these effective meetings. And, mm -hmm. and we would always start, it's like, okay, how many times have you met them? What do they know about you? Like, where's the conversation right now? So that's your starting point. Where do you want the conversation to end? How much time do you have to get there? and like literally map out the conversation. Okay, what are you gonna say? What do you think they're gonna say to that? And then like, how do you map your way to that? Like you can literally do that. And absolutely. And they would come back afterwards and be like, the conversation went exactly as we had mapped it. I'm like, yes, because you know, it's right. predictable. Um, what I would say is, okay, yeah, you, you can think about um, what you want out of it, what they want out of it, all this kind of stuff. But to take it to the next level, and again, knowing the audience, Think about the meetings that they have throughout their day. If they are like a very successful VC, they've been, you know, general partner at like top end firms in the Valley, what kind of meetings are they having throughout the day? What level of sophistication are the founders right. they are meeting with? And what is their expectation their from bar? you? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. What's the bar? And like, don't fall short of that bar. It's embarrassing for you. Even it's, if you don't want investment from them. Right. Right. All right. You don't want them going out saying like, yeah, I met with that company. They, you know, but I'm not interested because you probably want investment either later for this company mm -hmm. or later for another company or whatever it is. You want partnerships. You're going to want something. And yeah, people like talk. If, the, if they know the entire like GPLP like structure at, at Matrix or something, you're yeah, probably right. going to want to impress them just so your name can get out. Exactly. So, so there's that. Um, I think let's talk also about like 
this I, I've got a note here that I'm calling always be pitching, but that's not really what I mean by that. But um, always be pitching. <laughs> that's not really what I mean by that. Uh, I, oh, what I really mean is like, A, kind of take the meeting seriously. Yes. Right? Because it's disrespectful to you and to whoever you're meeting with to not take it seriously, which we talked about. But also some things you should always be prepared, like you should always have with mm-hmm. you. So, for example, your pitch deck, yep. right? You should always have an up-to-date copy of your pitch deck with you, with an appendix, yep. right? It doesn't mean that you always open with the pitch deck or even right. maybe you'll never open your laptop during that meeting, but you need to have it in case there's a question or like, or whatever, you, you need to have it. The other thing that you need to think about a pitch deck as is a, uh, a story. Yeah. The pitch deck is the story of your company. And so even if it's not an investor, I've used pitch decks for non-investors all the time. I just skip over the investor shit. Yep. I'm like, look, oh, here's here's the story of the company. Da, da, yeah. da, 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 da. Like, okay, great. It's, it's a nice little story arc. You've It's been, first of all, it's been hopefully. thought about, <laughs> hopefully. hopefully. <laughs> it's been designed, hopefully, yeah. right? So it's a very consciously um, uh, prepared yeah. document that should tell a good, compelling story. Right? Well, and frankly, if, you, if you've practiced it and if you've designed it properly, you've, you've kind of left the gaps where they need to be so that the the initial questions like lead you into your wheelhouse so that you right. can like impress them with your knowledge and um, there's very easy and non awkward ways to kind of go into a pitch deck mm-hmm. like if, if you walk into a meeting and they say all right well you know I, I know I know what you're doing but why don't you just start from the beginning and kind of tell me and then you could just say like well would oh, be great help- i'll just pull this yeah. Picture. Yeah. would it be helpful if i just went through the deck really quick and yeah. most times they'll say actually yeah that'd be great yeah no um, I, most people love that right yeah. and um and the other thing is kind of know what the the more detailed information is so if it's an investor meeting for example you mm-hmm. should have your appendix with all your stuff you should have your financials up to date so if they say oh can we you know they might ask a question that's off deck you right. need to be able to pull up your excel and be like well here brr, you know talk about it um, maybe that's not necessarily the case for every meeting, but you need to kind of know what that level of detail is and, and be prepared to talk about it. Yeah. Um, and you need to be able to demo your product or have samples, right? The thing that bothers me with CPG companies the most is when it's like, oh, I'm here to pitch you, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, do you have your product? Yeah. I didn't bring a sample with me. I'm like, well, <laughs> this the entire fucking business hinges on this goddamn sample and you are too lazy to throw it in your fucking bag like why are we meeting right like it's like carter needs some samples ah, <laughs> right no i mean look we get a lot of samples i don't need more samples uh, but um but the point is it's like this weird you become vaporware even yeah. if it's a real thing it's like oh i didn't bring it sorry i didn't bring any samples right it's the same thing for software like oh can you can you demo me something yeah oh no i'm like well why, why not that's like, that's why what, can't uh, you make like why so one of the guys that frequents gateway uh jacob from canada yeah yeah was like was good with the samples always shows up with like a big old <laughs> cooler bag with all these like ice cold like like fresh squeezed juices and it was just like he's the only exception i do need more samples from you <laughs> um so uh yeah 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 so look it's, it's that kind of preparation sure. um and Always be prepared please for right. the love of god yeah and a couple other kind of showing respect things uh that i just want to throw out which are little but meaningful um one is being on time mm-hmm. right uh something that I think is worse in this in the cannabis industry than it is in the tech industry is um, lack of punctuality. Yeah. Well, uh, again, at least in my experience, I'm not throwing everyone under the bus, but it seems to be that way. Again, expectations, right? Like maybe they're expecting you to be late and you're reinforcing a, a pre-existing stigma, even if it's not your fault, even if like you're normally punctual, right. it's going to be a ding just because that's... Be on time. Yeah. Be early, right? Um, another thing is... and you know, this is something that those of us who are loquacious need to be conscious of, and I think I do in meetings personally, but uh, it's fine to be asking people questions, even if it's a meeting. I mean, in fact, you should be asking them, like, yeah. tell me about your background. Tell me about what you're doing. Like, even a big, a, even a big time investor that you've done the research and you know, you know, if you don't want to look ignorant, you can say, well, I know you were a GP here and here and you've done X, Y, and Z, but tell me a little bit about why you're interested in the space and, yeah. you know, what brought you here. 
people like to talk about themselves and well, it shows that you're kind of curious about the in trying to build a relationship not just talk at them well and i mean yeah people like talking about themselves but you could take it to the pro level and and like any actual any uh, well-trained salesperson knows this that if you get them actually selling you on what they do right um, it kind of changes the power dynamic right. a little bit. And actually, if you're a real pro, you can get them selling you on what you do, which is uh, <laughs> right. Which is the, <laughs> which is the key, yeah. <laughs> right? That's extreme pro level. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, and this is, um, I I would rate myself a B at this, mm -hmm. but I would rate most people a, a D. So I think I'm pretty good. Okay. This device, yes, should be. I don't. A lot of people like. I think an A would be like putting it away, not even ever seeing it, right? right? I'm a B, I usually take it out and I like put it face down on the table out there. So it's there, but I'm not looking at it. Yeah. I, I, then I don't look at it. And by the way, if I do look at it, you're kind of sucking at the meeting usually. Right. And unless, unless, I mean, there have been times where I've said like, <laughs> I'm sorry, excuse me, I need to do blankety blank and I'll quickly do something, right? Yeah. Because it's like, I know something's about to happen and I'm waiting for a text or whatever, right? Um, but in general, you wanna like keep that away and not be looking at it. You know, playing with your phone, looking at your phone, doing any of that stuff is highly disrespectful. And um, frankly, as much as you think you can multitask, you can't. Hmm. Um, and so you're not actually paying attention as much as you should be if you're looking at your phone. So uh, put your fucking phone away during a meeting. Got it. Um, and I didn't mention this earlier, but or maybe I did. Close your social media browsers. Uh, when you're working as well, like, don't, don't, I guess that's not yeah. Well, maybe I'm idea. actually getting into the next thing, but like, um, so, so <laughs> social media ahead, is tough ahead. though, because like, right, like a, a lot of uh, promoting your business and, and doing a lot of that is the uh, social media effort. If you're the marketing person, you can spend your day on Facebook, but you should be doing it deliberately, not reading, look, looking at cat videos and reading the top ten BuzzFeed article that's that just true. came out. Right? I mean, so the there are actually tools out there that you can use so that. Maybe you set aside an hour in the morning where mm -hmm. you actually go through a bunch of filters and you you schedule a bunch of posts and then you're done. And then you wait until the next morning to do that again. Right. Okay. And you yeah. know, we all get that some people get news from some social media stuff and like you know, I get that. Um, realistically, um, I probably check Facebook maybe like when I first get in, in the morning, I spend a couple minutes, you know, or or frankly, <laughs> before I get in, in the morning, right? Sometimes I look at Facebook. Eh. Usually, like once in the afternoon, I'm like, oh, I wonder what's going on. Like, you know, did anything crazy happen in Washington or whatever? Okay, Probably. I'll check it out, right? Yeah. And then, and then, you know, at night again. But like, it's not a constantly on thing. And I will deliberately close my browser tabs because, again, when there's that moment of like, what should I do next? If the Facebook or Twitter browser tab is open, there's like this <laughs> unconscious click, like. Click. like <laughs> you need yeah. to kind of go like click your programs to go click it and get that dopamine hit. So, um, don't make it an option. Um, but, but this brings us to the last thing, um, which you touched on earlier, which mm -hmm. is like related to your social life and everything else. And as a founder, you need to, so, okay, wait, can I go on a small rant? We all you've know never, I can. <laughs> I was gonna say, you've yeah. never asked before. Um, sure, Carter. Uh, no, I, I, I retract that. I won't go on a small rant. I, I'll, I'll make it very small. Um, there is this, uh, there's this common, um, I won't say movement, but there's something that's become very common and it's, it's done under the guise of being supportive, mm -hmm. right? Is telling people that they can do anything, right? Like you can do anything. You can be great at this, 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 and this all in one thing. You're like, you're great. You can do, you can be a founder and an awesome hockey player and this and that. Like you can, you can be a super person, right? right? Um, no. <laughs> you can't. You cannot. Right? You do not. And then the reason for that is uh -huh. there's a limited number of hours in a day. Yes. Reality has a time constraint on your life. Yep. And any hour you spend doing one thing, you're not spending doing another. So if you're trying to get to be a better at tennis player yeah. for an hour, instead of reading that book uh, related to your business for an hour, you're becoming a worse founder and a better tennis player. It's true. Right? Now, I'm not saying make your life all about being founding, yeah. but recognize that you cannot succeed at everything. Yeah. You can't, which again gets back to like dropping the ball. What are you gonna do and what are you not gonna do? So, um, you know, my, a couple recommendations I have for founders is one, 
this is a harsh one, but essentialize your personal relationships, Yeah. right? You've got your family, you know, maybe you have a, a spouse or kids or whatever, okay? Obviously they should be very important to you. You should carve out time for them. Yeah. That guy you went to college with who likes to drink every other Friday night, mm. eh, who you don't really even like that much, but is kind of funny, you decide how you want to spend your Friday night, but think about whether that's really someone in your essential close friend list. Yeah, I've lost about 50 of those in the last two years. You should, Yeah. right? You should lose those people. And it's not because, it's not a judgy thing. It's not like they're bad people, but they're not helping you live the kind of life that you want to live, right? So essentialize your personal relationships. You need to have good personal relationships to be healthy. Mm -hmm. So just make sure they're, you know, you're spending the time with the right people. Instead of going out with, uh, your college buddy for two hours on a Friday night, go go take your spouse out somewhere. Go do something that's connecting with the people that are more important to you, yeah. right? Can, um, I, I want to just take a little bit of a tangent here. Sure. Um, because I have fallen into the trap of making everything about work. Like, right. Which you some, also can't do. Right. And, and, and sometimes you need to. But, um, you know, I have realized that the time that I spend away from work, and, and I control it very, very deliberately, mm -hmm. um, but that time can be spent and still some eventually be related back to your work. Um, and, I, and I think about the, the time and effort we spend with the tech startup still, and mm -hmm. the time and effort that I spend um, in the food and CPG industry. Um, mm -hmm. It's constantly being related back to what we do, and it's I, I yep. you know I'm grateful that I've learned to kind of set aside that time and, and not feel guilty about it. You know, mm -hmm. if I spend a day um, working on some business plans for for food companies, um, you know, I could look at it as like, oh, that's that's time I should have been spending catching up on the emails with Gateway. But um, you know, those are our relationships that are built to kind of not only expand the the potential for our our knowledge set, but also um, you know, just kind of freeing up the mind and thinking about things differently and thinking about how, like, you know, other things in life can relate to kind of what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Having understanding of, like, multidisciplinary understanding or doing, like, that does expand your ability to solve problems in any particular discipline. Yeah. So that that's good. Um, I would say kind of even generally, like, um, you know, aside from essentializing your relationships, essentialize your hobbies and your free time. And, and right. so what that means is it doesn't mean you can't go if you know, play tennis. Like, that, that's okay, right? But recognize, like, you probably shouldn't play tennis and rock climb and do ice hockey and, like, <laughs> learn to whatever. Like, that's – you can do those things, but if you want to have a life like that, go work for Google and spend all of your free time doing those hobbies, mm -hmm. right? But if you're going to found a company, you need to figure out – what are the things that I need to do for my own mental and personal health? Mm -hmm. That includes relationships, it includes physical health and eating, and also just kind of like psychological health, yeah. right? Like I, this is my own personal thing, I need time alone, I need like free time alone to just like not be thinking about yep. other stuff, right? Some people don't need it as much as I do, I need it more, right? Fine, right. but like know what those things are that you need and, uh, and give those to yourself in a very deliberate way, yeah. uh, which is how Netflix comes into this. Like, there's nothing wrong with watching Netflix, mm -hmm. but you probably, don't want to, you probably don't need to be watching Netflix two hours a night in order to recover mentally, <laughs> right? That's just lazy, right. right? Having a show that you like, that you follow on Netflix with your spouse, fine. If that's a way that like you get mentally and psychologically rejuvenated, mm -hmm. fine, but do it deliberately and know that, okay, this is the time I'm carving out for kind of recovery mentally and emotionally yeah. and physically. And like, and these are the things I need to do. I need to go running. I need to like watch that latest episode of Better Call Saul and uh, whatever. And I need to like, Better you know, calls. spend time, whatever, right? <laughs> like, you know, I've revealed my- <laughs> That's your, that's yes, your right? one example? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I shouldn't judge, I guess. I you shouldn't. Judge. You can judge, um, uh, and and whatever else is right, and, and and you know, and my spouse and I are gonna like cook that dinner that we wanted to cook together, and blah, blah, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and those things are important, but again, they need to be essential, essentialized. And I think a lot of people are used to even in their private lives being very um, kind of chaotically yeah. focused or cha um, chaotically driven. So it's like someone will call me. I'm like, hey, do you want to go do something something on Saturday? I'm like, no, I like. Yeah. That's not one of the things on my list. And actually, you're not, I don't say this, like, 
you're not one of the people that I've prioritized. So like, like, no, actually, I don't get rejuvenated spending time with you, and I, yeah. and that's not one of the activities I want to spend time, with, right? <laughs> and there, you know, there are other cases where there are people that I that are close friends, right. and we've when we do certain things together, and, and sometimes I have to tell them no, like I can't do it this weekend, but. Yeah. And we plan, I'm like, okay, next Saturday afternoon, you're gonna come over and that's the time we're gonna carve out to do this. But um, again, it's all about being very deliberate and essentialized in, in what you're doing and that includes your personal life. Mm -hmm. so that's my two cents. I think that's great. <laughs> rant, we, I don't know if it's rant. <laughs> can we just step, like, these are like kind of three big topics. Can we just step back through them really yes. quick just to kind of like reiterate? So okay. number one. Deliberate versus kind of an interrupt-driven work style. Deliberate, take control. Yep. Two is basically like meetings, like how meetings. to get you know how to get the most out of and properly conduct yourself in interactions with other people, basically, yeah. right? And wait, in a business sense. Can I pause here because I just thought of like my own like experience. Like, don't feel bad if you have been uh, a victim of your own unpreparedness. Um, I remember. None of us are perfect here <laughs> by any means. I mean, I, I, I remember um, my first venture capitalist meeting uh, when I was pitching my very first startup. Yeah. And I was lucky enough to uh, have a personal connection to Stuart Alsop, um, you know, former uh, tech crunch writer, mm -hmm. you know, Stuart uh, Alsop. Yeah, Alsop will be, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Big, very well known. Yeah, music. that was my first investor meeting. Nice. Um, <laughs> And I and I show up and I'm I'm with my my co-founder, and he's like, all right, go. And I'm like, uh, so yeah, I've been working on this project and just kind of like stumbled like through this thing. Pitch, yeah. No, I was just like, and and we got to the meeting. He's all, how come it took you five minutes to tell me like who you were and what your background was? I'm like, oh, I just thought this was a working meeting and that we would kind of right. like work through this. And he's like, all right, well, no, see you next time. <laughs> I'm like. Right. Oh shit! I just yeah. completely blew. I, I have similar experiences yeah. like that, where it's like I randomly met like very well-known VCs early and like totally <laughs> fucked it up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of them I remember like we didn't know how to value ourselves, and it was like literally almost 10x the valuation we should have even talked about. And so right. it was like, I love what you're doing. I don't really want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> um, right? and, and he didn't talk to us ever again. Um, the other guy, um, the other guy actually uh, ended up being really nice um, yeah. and uh, you know, kind of coaching me a little bit. And um, but again, totally failed. And so, um, yeah, that's a that's a good point. We mm -hmm. we do fail at this stuff. So the third thing was kind of your social, like your social life and essentializing mm -hmm. all the things that aren't around your business. Uh, does 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 the Exciting, ever-growing studio audience have any questions? Uh, yeah, there we go. Michael, this is the cue to hand PL the microphone. There you go. <laughs> so I was thinking through the, uh, you know, when you're a founder, mm -hmm. and if you've come out of an environment where you've been given tasks, so if you work for Google or Facebook and people give you the task, mm -hmm. yep. it's sort of hard uh, and difficult to get to the point where you know what to put off. Yeah. And how do you, and, and wanted to get you guys input yeah. on that. This, this brings up a really good point. Um, you know, I, I spent six years as a, as a consultant and a project manager, and uh, I would always coach um, the new juniors on how to communicate their, uh, their bandwidth to me as a project mm. manager. And it was okay to push back, because if they didn't push back, I was just gonna keep loading keep it on top of them. Right. And I think we've told that to, to Luke and Michael, it was just like, you need to tell me when when you're approaching that capacity and that when if you need help kind of prioritizing i'm happy to sit down and do that but if i don't get any pushback you know i'm just going to keep and offload everything i offload have offload everything right yeah. um so that is actually a good strong way to increase your value and actually start proving yourself as a project manager mm -hmm. um to be like all right i can do this but that's going to sacrifice this and these are the trade-offs and here's what i think is actually essential what do you think Right, and then eventually you work into that position where, yeah, you're the one making the decisions. Right, but as a founder, you don't have that, right? So I think <laughs> the question's like, how do you know? Right. How do you self-manage there? Um, and I would just get back to, um, look, I would get back to the main metric, right? And so the way that I would describe it is there's this kind of main metric that you should be pushing for with your company, which hopefully has been set deliberately and consciously. Um, and 
there are some kind of pillars that need to be in place there, right? Like, for example, um, you know, paying your rent isn't your main metric, but if you don't pay your rent, you can't accomplish your main metric, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So there are things that need to be done <laughs> that are kind of boring day-to-day -day things, but um, the, the, the way to kind of prioritize that and know what to drop is like, okay, this is my this is my one metric that matters, and and what that looks like often for founders is not getting distracted by shiny objects. Because you know, if you can actually focus on only one revenue stream and only one business and only one thing, yeah, there's a lot to do. But you, that question won't actually enter your mind. You'll know kind of what you need to be doing. You don't need to be answering that email from some you know potential IT vendor, right? You need to be doing your thing, right? But where it gets where it gets difficult is where it's like, oh well they want to pay me to do this kind of related thing and maybe there's an opportunity here and like it's all the shiny objects that are quote like business opportunities for a founder are the worst fucking thing in the world <laughs> right like business opportunities are your death <laughs> like you don't want business opportunities yeah. right <laughs> we 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 get at least like no sort of at least two or three emails a week asking if oh, we yeah. want to set up a subsidiary somewhere oh yeah no i mean like, we get yeah <laughs> yes, we get all this kind of we, we get business opportunities all day long, right? Um, and so you'll and you'll get that, and and th those business opportunities will kill you. So it's mostly that that you're dropping, and then you know obviously you need to uh, prioritize the like what kind of people are you know you need to kind of stoke relationships with, right, and foster relationships with. So um, you know, hint, it's not a service provider. But it might be a future customer, <laughs> right? So those are the emails you answer. Any any other? And then also from the meetings portion, yeah. um, when you take on a meeting and sort of we come in, we meet with you all, or we meet with VCs. What is a good ask? You know, what you know, it's hard. I think it's hard sometimes to know what we can ask for and what's going above and beyond. Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, some of it's a judgment call, but uh, you know. I would say don't beat around the bush for starters. Uh, nothing's more yeah. annoying than someone not having the confidence just to come out and say what they want. Um, and so if you're looking for fundraising and that's the reason you're, you're meeting with the person to say, well, you know, obviously, you know, we are raising our first fund. Um, so that's kind of our first priority right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if that's not a viable path for this relationship, then, you know, uh, going off and talking about you know, whatever it is that you also need, right? right. Um, but yeah, I mean. I mean, it depends on the meeting with who the meeting's with, right. right? What your ask is. For VCs in particular or angels in particular, I don't think there's a, I don't, I actually don't think there's such a thing as overreaching. I mean, there might be overvaluing, but yeah. saying like, I want $5 million. That's why I'm sitting across the table from me. Right. Like, and the person might say like, okay, well, <laughs> that's not going to happen ever because I don't like you. Or they might say, okay, well, the next step would be to pull my partner in and blah, blah, blah. And I need this information and this and this and this. And we would only really be able to put in a million dollars. But that, like, okay, fine. Like, that's, uh, that's fine. But I've never seen a VC, and maybe this is just because I haven't had enough VC meetings. I'm not sure. But like, I've never even heard of anyone complain that, like, the founder had the gall to ask for the money. Yeah. Like, that's. That's the fucking point of the meeting. They like, <laughs> it is more annoying when yeah. the founders beating around the bush, being like, well, like, I don't know, I, I just wanted to meet, right? Or like, <laughs> well, and, and I think we've actually had had shows about this, but there are the strategic beating around the bush by like asking advice and being like, what would make this an interesting? Sure, although that's it's before you're on. actually ready. You should right. know whether you're worth investing or not, and not be kidding yourself. Yes, right. And so before you meetings and make that ask, you should have validation from people who tell you, yeah, you're at a point where you should be asking for money. Yeah. You're ready, right? And there are a lot of people that don't know that, yeah. unfortunately. Fair. Which is a whole other topic. Yeah. Anything else, uh, Anything else, Princessa? No? Uh, we actually have one question from the audience. Um, in the right. comments section, Wes Martin asks, uh, hey, Wes. how many meetings should you have before a contract is written and signed? Super tactical. <laughs> I mean, it completely depends on the nature of the contract, right? Yeah. I mean, if it's uh, if it's for a rental car, one. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. If it's for the acquisition of AOL, 
yeah. probably 800 meetings. I don't know. Um, so I, I, I think it's completely dependent. I think the important thing, though, is um, I mean, that's kind of a flippant answer, Wes. But I think the important thing is actually for whatever it is you're, you're having the meeting for and whatever contract it is, you should have a, a very clear pipeline or a, um, a very clear stage stages yeah. of what you're doing. Like, okay, what we're going to do first, we need them to do like first, we're going to sign a term sheet and then we're going to do this and then we're going to do that and then we're going to do this and like and just kind of have that laid out what you expect that the the steps to look like to yeah. get to where you want and i don't know how many steps that is because it depends on complexity and then the purpose of each meeting is to get to the next yeah. step well and, and we've talked about this before we've talked about the the engineering approach to fundraising and how to like kind of structure a pipeline right. and then once you have that structured because you've had say 10 meetings then you're kind of like gamifying it by reducing the time that each person spends in each bucket right. um you know with the with fundraising you know it could be seven eight ten meetings sometimes um, uh, yes, although we met we, someone the other day who writes a check at the first meeting, if yeah, he likes you, well, and he has his checkbook in his pocket, <laughs> and he writes a check and says, send me the terms. <laughs> like, okay. That's great. Yeah. That happens, right? So um, w w you've got so, another one. So what about, you know, um, in the cannabis industry, people yeah. come to us, they want to buy product. Yeah. How many times should we be meeting before they actually say, yes, I want to engage you in your service, and I'm ready to sign a contract? They want to buy product? Yeah. Well, the, 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 the cannabis industry is a little unique in the fact that, you know, it's a lot of relationship vetting. And, um, you know, when you're talking about product, you're talking about the quality of the product, where it's sourced, how it's handled, the, the cleanliness of it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in the cannabis industry, things do move a little bit slower because there are a lot of meetings that are had. Yeah, I, I would the my recommendation there would be to. Um, discount so a lot of people have a uh, I, I princess i give you the book the mom test so this is kind of related to it's not customer development per se but it's related right a lot of people say things that they don't mean because it's very difficult to um, be completely honest with someone who comes into you if you're going to reject them right vcs are classically known for this no vc ever says that i've ever heard uh, I love the concept. Uh, I love what you've done. I don't think you're a good founder. But 90% of the time, that's the reason they're not writing a check, right? <laughs> so um, similarly, uh, I think, you know, if you go in and say like, hey, like, what do you think about my product? And do you like my thing? And do you like this? Like, they're like, yeah, that, that's that's great. That's cool. You're, you're great. They're not going to say, I don't really like your business model. I don't believe that you can do what you're saying, blah, blah, blah. Like they're, they're probably not gonna say that to your face. They're just gonna try and avoid you. And they may have some more courtesy meetings, yeah. right? But um, what you need to really figure out is what are the actions, you need to see if they will actually take actions in order to pursue you, right? And you can make those actions, you can, you can make things for them to do that are kind of fabricated. So as an example, uh, we're revealing our secret to all the potential potential <laughs> L, uh, future LPs for other gateway funds. But, you know, we have a term sheet mm -hmm. that's non-binding that we have people sign in DocuSign. It means nothing legally. It's absolutely worthless. But it's a quick review of like, oh, this is what I'm doing. It's non-binding. Like, okay, great. And they sign it. And like, the act of signing it is a psychological signal that like, okay, yeah, they are, they do want, they want to go to the next step, mm -hmm. right? And so you can manufacture, we don't need a term sheet, right? Um, but you can manufacture those kind of things. And so w depending on your business and what you're trying to do, I would kind of manufacture things for them to do to demonstrate that they kind of want to be working with you and then tr try and get them over those hurdles. And if they're resistant, then you've got to move on. You've yeah. got limited time, drop them and move on. And, and another thing is, uh, and this goes for many different types of meetings and connections is asking for references. Um, mm. You know, when you ask for someone for references, if they're very professional, they'll have them ready and they'll just shoot them right over. They should have like three to five references that you can call and you should call. Uh, and in those conversations, if any red flags arise from people that they've personally put you in contact with, run. Mm -hmm. I mean, I recall, you know, I remember doing reference checks um, earlier on in my career and there being little things be like, oh, that's not so much a big deal. That's probably something we could work around. 
that ended up being the hinge point of usually if a reference is giving you any kind of negative like any kind of red flag yeah. it's their way of signaling to you that you shouldn't like they're a reluctant reference right right she's my buddy yeah but I, I, could, I really can't <laughs> recommend you hire her. So I'm going to say like, yeah, I, you I, know, I'm going to mention some minor thing just so you kind of, that's my signal. Yeah, right? I couldn't say no. <laughs> right. Um, uh, what was it? My, I worked for a guy once who's, uh, he used to say to, to people who um, he didn't like, who yeah. used him as a reference. When people called, he would say, he had a very carefully chosen phrase. What was it? Oh, you would be lucky to have him work for you. And he realized you could take it either way. It was like, You'd be lucky for him to like actually do any work, <laughs> or you'd be lucky to have him work. For you. And like that was his, like stock phrase. I don't know. That's it's like, a little. Ambiguous. It was a little subtle, right? <laughs> but like he was very proud of this phrase because he was like, "Oh yeah, that's what I just say." Well, I'm like, "All right, well." Um, <laughs> but uh, you'd be lucky to have him work out for you. <laughs> yeah. Look, the the, the 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 caveat to kind of moving on that I will I will say is. Um, you know, depending on your relationship that you've built with the, the person you're selling to or whatever, um, you can ask them. You can say like, hey, like, it's cool that you don't, it's cool that you don't want this. I totally get it. By the way, like, do you mind just like telling me about what your concerns is? We want to improve and be better for the next client. And like, usually people are, you know, generous enough that they'll, yeah, sure. Well, for us, we don't like this and this and we kind of need it. And it's like, okay. You know, maybe the product that you're selling needs to be changed, right? And so, Getting that feedback, uh, if you can, is, is important. Okay, any other questions from... Uh, yeah, one final uh, question okay. uh, from Rich Moskowitz. Okay. Rich. Uh, in a, in a pre-revenue startup, how important is it, um, the pro forma numbers uh, that you report? The numbers themselves... <laughs> yeah, okay. We just talk about the pro forma. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just, I mean... No, it's important to have them. Yes, it's important to have a pro forma and know what it is, I, I suppose. I, I, it was a long time, actually, before I knew what a pro forma was as a pre-rev, you know, like... It's a fiction novel in, in Excel. Right, especially as a pre-rev. Um, <laughs> 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 so, uh, look, the, the, um, you need a financial model with pro forma projections. However... The value of it is really, um, really to demonstrate that you understand the knobs, and we've said this before, right? You understand the knobs and the levers and the things that need to be adjusted to make your business successful. You understand that, like, it's the critical that the margin is this level, and if this assumption here is wrong, then it falls apart, or if this assumption is different, then this happens. Like, to show that it's a very thorough, well thought out model, you understand how, how revenue and profitability is affected by all these inputs. Um, you know, that plus there's a sufficient market size here. Like those are the two things that you you kind of show with that those those that financial model. Um, the no one actually believes. I mean, I, well, I said well, this well, at the well. Founder Institute <laughs> the other day, like, right, you, your your revenue numbers are what won't happen. Can we caveat that with like no sophisticated <laughs> person believes like there are. Sure, I guess one, one key lesson I've learned from from entering this industry is if so, if the first words out of out of a potential investor's mouth are, "What are your five year projections?" and "Can I see the pro forma?" they don't really understand early stage companies, and they they might be a, a source of capital. Those are actually good questions for an operating company that has a history where the pro forma is meaningful. Right, pro formas are meaningful when there is a proven history of operations, yeah. and you and you kind of can base that off the past. They're not as meaningful as we just said when your pre revenue. Yeah. So yes. And investors who are, there are investors who maybe are legitimate good investors at uh, either different stages or in or businesses that are different kinds of businesses, mm -hmm. but don't know how to analyze early stage yeah. pre-revenue pre startups. And, and look, I mean, there will be people that ask you that question and you may want their money. Um, but if you, <laughs> <laughs> if you are a high performing, actual like sexy young startup, um, you want an investor that's going to be a value add that's going to be aligned with what you're doing and understand your business at this point in time. And right. so finding those investors that aren't asking those questions the first time you're talking to them and pitching your vision and, and kind of like the, the really crux of what you're doing, um, they probably aren't the, the greatest first investor for you. Sure. Although I, I would say there's nothing wrong with educating a founder if you're an investor and educating an investor if you're a founder. And they can sure. say, well, look, you know, uh, I, we do have this business model. Here's the financial model, right? Let's open up Excel together. 
Uh, however, look, we're you know we're pre-revenue, so all of this is based on these assumptions. These are what these assumptions are. Blah blah blah. Like, you know, this is very tentative. In my view, what I think is important is that we understand the unit economics here and the and the potential. And we will see over the next several years whether this is specifically the way that things will work out from a financial perspective, or whether there will be, you know, something something other than this, right? right? But you know, you can have that that conversation, and if that doesn't scare them away, and they like, oh, okay, I've never really done an early stage, maybe that yeah. turns into a conversation and a check, and they turn out to be okay, um, or maybe they just say, well, I go by performance. It's like, okay, yeah. well, then you should not be writing checks, right? I was just say have that conversation earlier. Like if it comes up, mm -hmm. just have the conversation early. Like don't try to like hobble together as quickly as you can a professional pro forma and like get it to them. Like try to show them the financial model and have the conversation at the same right. time. Right. So you shouldn't have like, in my opinion, you shouldn't have like a PPM with pro forma yeah. statements and like the, the big legal disclaimer at the beginning and like look like business yeah. Model. I mean like <laughs> yeah. that's like a. It's masturbation is all it is, mm. right? Um, so, interesting. It's, like, it's not it's not worth doing. <laughs> Maybe it's worth doing if you really enjoy it. I guess. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, you have nothing a deck. And you have, uh, yeah, nothing against masturbation. Uh, that was an insult to masturbation. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. All right. Going on off, that note, going off the maybe, rails. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we probably don't have any more questions now, do we? Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> and if we do, we probably should be addressing them on air. <laughs> right. Right. Um, okay. Well. Cool. Thanks everyone for watching. Uh, we will be back next week at 10 a.m. Do we have a guest next week or no? Uh, maybe we will. Here, maybe wait. We won't. Let me violate my uh, my rule. It might be on the calendar if we do. I don't know. I, I don't. You don't think, think we have something? On we the don't. Calendar. You have no idea. All right. I don't even know if I'll be here next week. What? what? Don't I have to go to what? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, am, aren't I aren't I judging some pitch competition for Canopy? It, we don't need to have this on air. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys. Uh, great. Thanks for watching. We will. Uh, you can see us at oh.gtwi.co, uh, Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, podcast, whatever else. Feel free to send us questions with the hashtag GatewayOH, and reach out to Michael if you would like to work out of Gateway Works, and he will give you a discount on your first month. It's your golden episode next week. It's the episode that will be the answer to the... Next week is the answer to the universe. And what's the phrase? God damn it. Universe and everything and something. I forget what it is. Episode 42. It's episode week. 42. If you're a Douglas Adams fan, look it up and you can decide for yourself what it's about. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching. We should probably sign off now, Luke.